Shalom. My name is Rabbi Hill Van Leeuwen, and I am the head of World Mizrahi's leadership programs. To Heal a Fractured World, a lecture series on the teachings of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Latzal is presented to you in partnership with Achevra Lechegir Amikra. Thank you, Israel Crystal, for your partnership. We are happy to invite you to our eighth lecture on the topic of Rabbi Sachs' self-help books and the quest for community. It is most appropriate that our distinguished speaker today is Dr. Erica Brown, a scholar and award-winning author of several books, including her current work on a commentary on Kohelet. Dr. Brown was recently appointed the inaugural director of the new Sachs Hernstein Center for Values and Leadership at Yeshiva University. We are very excited to have you, Dr. Brown, speak to us today. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, and it's always a pleasure to teach in honor of, uh, of my beloved teacher, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. So um, I, uh, I chose an unusual topic today to talk about self-help books, uh, not something you usually get in a shiur, but it's something that I noticed in, for those of you who are avid Rabbi Sachs readers, you'll notice that often he makes a sporadic comment here and there about self-help books. And it's sort of an interesting feature. And um, in his, in his uh, last book, Morality, uh, he actually was very explicit about his, the appeal of the appeal of self-help books. So we're gonna talk about what he meant by that and, uh, and why he both valued them and also felt that self-help books in some way diminish us from building the kind of communities of care and um, of chesed, of compassion that we require in the modern age. So what I'd like to do with your permission is to learn a little bit with you, not something that Rabbi Sachs, uh, not a text that Rabbi Sachs taught, but I was trying to think of a good example from Tanakh that would exemplify the point. So we'll study uh, we'll study this chapter from Sefer Malachim, the book of Kings two. Uh, we'll look at this together and then, uh, and then we'll look at some quotes from, uh, from Rabbi Sachs's uh, immense legacy. And please feel free if you'd like to unmute or you can drop a question in the chat. I'd love this to be interactive. So we'll go to our shared screen. Um, this is uh, my favorite uh, my favorite photo of Rabbi Sachs, so I like to use it when I'm uh, when I'm teaching his material. Um, for those of you who know, Rabbi Sachs was a fan of the yellow tie. He thought it made uh, someone told him once that it made him happy, and so Rabbi Sachs uh, thought a lot about joy and happiness, and so he wore uh, he wore this tie to uh, to signify that. And you'll find a lot of photos with him. But it, this is uh, this is when he received the Templeton Prize, a very prestigious uh, prize for those who are doing important global work work in the arena of faith. And you can see here a, a real sense of, of, of joy in his face. So let's go to our let's go to our text. Um, this is a text that may be fami familiar to many of you uh, or, or new to some of you. It's a text that I think is, uh, is very, very uh, rich and nuanced. And so I'd like to read it, do a close reading with you of the text and then talk about how it fits in within the framework of self-help and the quest for community. So one day, and it was on the day, this expression will appear frequently, and the chapter seems to give us an indication of the passage of time, and we'll see this, we'll see this again. Alicia passed by, Viavor is another word that we'll pay attention to because it will also reappear. As Elisha would pass by the town of Shunem, you know, let's say he was on a on the on the tour, right? On the tour, the prophetic tour, and um, and solving problems as as he was wont to do. And he would stop in Shunem, and there was an Isha Gedola there. So various Mefarshim commentaries. Uh, talk about what Gedola means. Does this mean she was a person of particular holiness and importance in the community? Does this mean she was a, money, a woman of particular wealth? And as we go on, we can see that both of those will be indicated by the text. And she, Dechazekbo, she impressed upon him to break bread there, right? So impressed upon him seems here it's translated as urged him. Um, one has a sense that, you know, she would uh, maybe even in a meddling way, she would say, please, please eat with us. And every once in a while, mide avro, I told you that word avro will come up. Every once in a while, when he would pass by, he would turn there and he would uh, take a meal with them. But Tomer Elisha, hine na yadati ki shaluhim kadoshu over alenu tamid. 
Now here we see a very different perception that's given by the woman herself. The omniscient narrator gives you a scene, you know, that Alicia would pass through Shunam every once in a while and eat there. Here we have her words. This woman says to her husband, and notice she is not named. He says, you know, I have a feeling. I know that this man is Kadosh. He is, this is a holy man. And he's one who, the one who comes to us all the time. And so she has a sense um, why she doesn't know exactly what he does. I don't know if he gives out business cards that say prophet in Israel. I assume not, but she has this sense and um, that, that, that he's a person of importance. And then she takes a jump. Let's make a guest room for him. It'll be a small room. And we'll put there, we'll put a bed there, we'll put a, a table there, we'll put a chair, we'll put a lamp there. And when he comes to us, we'll, we'll make it available to him. So this is incredible hospitality. I don't know if you have guests who come regularly. I don't know how many of you are renovating your homes to accommodate those guests, um, especially if, as, as seems to indicate between the first and second verses we're studying, which are verses Pasuk, Psukim, Dalit, and Hay, that, uh, that maybe he doesn't come there very often. And maybe the husband might be a little puzzled that we're making this fancy uh, space for this, uh, for, this one, uh, for this one man who comes infrequently. Vayhi hayom, again, we see vayhi hayom, and we see it here repeated. Vayhi hayom vayavo shama v'yasar el ha'aliyah v'yishkav shama. This is important, a little detail that will foreshadow his return to the room. So when it came, you know, one day, the day passed when he came and notice VSR, this idea that we have also in the language, repeated in the language, that he turned into this small attic or as it's translated chamber and he lay down there. So let's keep that image of lay down there um, top of mind. And uh, there's, no, there's no greeting, right? He doesn't, he doesn't greet this woman. He, it's almost as if there, there were an outside entrance and he climbed up the stairs or went down the stairs and he went into uh, this chamber. He said to Gehazi, his servant, So he says, you know, why don't you get that Shunammite woman? Go, I, I can't remember her name. Just, just, just go bring her to me. And, and then uh, he called her, Gehazi called her and she stood before him. Now it's not clear who she's standing before. Is it Gehazi? Or is it, uh, or is it Alicia? Let's assume it's Gehazi for the moment. But there's something that's very belittling about this. On the one hand, the Navi, the prophet, wants to recognize the Shunammite woman and do something for her. But here is a, a here you see an imbalance of the relationship. He, she is willing to make an entire guest room for him. And think about all the details. What would a prophet need? Well, a prophet would need not only a bed, but a prophet needs a table upon which to write important things. A prophet will need a lamp. Now she is thinking about him in detail and he does not even know her name. So let's go on. And, uh, and Gehazi says something that's very beautiful. You have gone to all this, he understands, you've gone to all this trouble, right? You've sort of like, uh, you know, from the charade, right? So like the, the shaky or the trumblingness, the sense that you've really put yourself out here, all of this difficulty, what can we do for you? Or Elsar Hatzaba. So really interesting interaction. And the first interaction we see between the Nav between Gehazi and this woman is he says, you know, what can we do? We actually know some important people. Would you like us to speak to the king on your behalf? Would you like to speak to an officer? We can speak to an officer in the army. Maybe you need special security detail. And she says, I'm actually, I, we'd say in America, I'm good, right? I, I, I have all I need. She says, and this is an interesting expression. I dwell amongst my people. Now, a dwell against my people may be a way of saying, you guys occupy space with the upper echelon of society. I, I live amongst my people, I am fine. And it's an interesting way of saying no thank you is in a way she's also in some way chastising them um, and maybe with due cause. Here she's gone to all this trouble 
but no one has actually said, hello, how are you? They've just said, what can we get you? Maybe even assuming that she only went to the trouble so that she could be repaid in some way. And this was opportunistic so that she could get something out of the interaction. So again, now we, we, we're pivoting. We're going back to Gehazi now speaking to Alicia. And uh, Alicia says, well, wh what should we do for her? You know what I noticed? There were no little tykes toys in her house. I didn't see, there's no children here. And, uh, and her husband looks pretty old. So now this is a really interesting uh, hostess gift is to say, we have a child for you. And we'll see that this becomes problematic. On the one hand, there's a sense that Gehazi is taking in this, this woman's circumstances, that perhaps she's being particularly kind to them because she's not investing her kindness upon her children. But on the other hand, there's something, something atonal about this moment. Let's continue. Vayama karala vikrala vatamo bapata. So um, Gehazi said, you know, call her. Again, he's not calling her. He needs to always send someone else to do this work. And he calls her, Gehazi calls her, and she stands at the patach, at um, the threshold. The threshold moments are extremely important in Tanakh. Uh, we actually have some coming up in, uh, in the book of Esther and in the apocryphal text of Esther of sort of standing in the doorway and waiting to be noticed or with uh, uh, Mordechai always in the Shah HaMelech, always standing at the, uh, at the gate. When you stand at the threshold, you're not inside and you're not outside. And in a way, this, uh, this cue of where she is physically, this staging, suggests us something very, very powerful, that she's, she doesn't feel comfortable, even though she's built this space, she does not enter the space. She has a sense that there's holiness and there's her, and there's a space between them. So let's continue, let's continue. Uh, so rather than ask her, we thought maybe you'd like a child. Would you indeed like a child? They say, he says the same thing that Sarah was told, um, that at this time, or that Avraham then told to Sarah, at this time next year, you will, uh, you will hold a son, right? You you will embrace a son. And she says, instead of, thank you, that's what I always wanted. She says, Allah doni. no, no, don't do that, uh, man of God. Don't, don't tease your, your servant in this way. So I want to pause for a second um, and ask you why you think she says to him, don't ridicule me like this. So I'm going to stop the share. Interested in your thoughts. Why would she say, and please feel free to drop in the chat or to, or to unmute. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Why would she say, I mean, if she doesn't have a child, doesn't she want a child? Why not give her a child? Why would you say, don't belittle me this way? It's Sunday morning. Maybe you need another cup of coffee. That's okay. Go get one. Any thoughts on this? Maybe she has miscarried. Thank you, Pauline. Maybe she's miscarried a few times. Like Sarah, she's also on. Well, Jody, she, she feels unworthy. Thank you. I imagine if you've been through this difficulty, if you've prayed and prayed and uh, maybe no one has answered, you learn to live with your circumstance and you don't want the hashlaya, the disappointment of, of, of having this not work out yet once again. I mean, how painful it is uh, to go through this experience. And now she says, please, please don't do this to me. This isn't fair. Um, I've, I've closed that door. Um, uh, Harriet says, is he negating her worth unless she has a child, right? Maybe seeing that with, without a child, she'll be, you know, with a child, she'll be complete and she's incomplete now. And, um, and, and Deborah, she doesn't want to be disappointed yet again. And when she says, ami, ani yoshavet, maybe she's saying to the prophet on some, on multiple levels, I have learned to live with my life the way that it is. And I've made a good life and I don't need anything. And that statement, I think, is extremely powerful. If someone said to you, a person of power, I can do anything for you, anything you want, and you said, you know, actually, 
I'm fine the way I am. I'm content. I live amongst my people happy, happily. That's just, that's just a remarkable spiritual level of, um, of life satisfaction. So I'm going to go uh, back to our shared screen. Keep those chats coming. Always want to hear them. So um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what she says. And it's because obviously she hasn't been consulted. She hasn't been greeted. Nothing in this. And, uh, and what happened, what, what, the, what the prophet uh, portended did indeed take place. So exactly as Elisha told her, and, and remember, she's only called the Shunammite woman. He doesn't even bother saying, what is your name? So he's giving her a child without even knowing her name. How, how, how can you operate this way? You, you almost have a sense as the reader that something will go disastrously wrong. Bigdal Hayaled. Notice is sort of the pacing that keeps continuing with this story. So this boy goes out one day to see his father who's among the reapers. So we don't have any scene of this child growing up. There's no sense of his childhood. Um, this is one of the multiple uh, barren texts in Tanakh. And of course, all of them are connected linguistically and thematically. Here we have a piece, as you can see, of the Sarah story. We also have a piece of, um, of our story of Shimshon, the birth of Shimshon, with a woman who is unnamed, who is given this gift that she did not ask for. And what's striking is that in certain stories, like the story of Sarah, like the story of Hana, there's an episode of nursing, right, of weaning, of being with the child, uh, even Moshe, who's separated from his mother, Miriam manages for him to be to be uh, nursed and then and then weaned. So there's some kind of connection to his family in the formative years. But Vigdal Hayeled almost suggests that he raised himself, that somehow this child wasn't really wanted, and the child grew up disconnected. And so he walks to his father, not his mother, notice, not his mother. And Vayoma El Aviv, Roshi Roshi. And, and the first thing we hear in the words of the child is that his, his head is hurting him. My head, my head. Vayoma El Hanar, Se'eu El Imo. And uh, the father says, who's also not named, says to a servant who is also not named, take him to his mother. Now you could say, what callousness not to take care of your own child. If your child is complaining, of a headache and it's perhaps the middle of a day in the ancient Near East, chances are the child is dehydrated. The child need, needs water, the child needs to be taken care of. But is there some, some disconnect here, a sense of absentee parents that no one is actually taking care of him and that he cries out and even when he cries out, no one responds to him. And because the woman never asked for this child, the man certainly never had a say in it. He says, well, bring this child to the mother. I, I don't even know what to do here. This is the only act right now of physical loving attention is done not by a parent, but by a servant. He's taken to his mother. He sits on her knees until the afternoon and he dies. Now, all of us who are parents, grandparents, you think to yourself, what do you mean? Why do you feed this child? Why don't you do something with this child? Why don't you respond to this child? And P.S., this is the Haftorah that we read when we read um, Breshit Kafbet, we read the story of Avram and Akedah. These are two parents who received at a time in their lives when they never thought they would have their own children, who were granted children, and then suddenly God wants to take those children. And maybe from her perspective, before we heap blame upon the Shunammite woman, maybe she didn't understand really, it, you know, if God gives and God takes, uh, this child is, this child is a holy child. This child wasn't something I asked for. Uh, maybe God gave this child and God took the child away and thus proving what she said to the prophet in the first place. I told you, don't disappoint me. And now look what you've done. You've created, this child has been raised by us and, and he too will die. And this, uh, and this disappointment is the greatest disappointment of all. Watch what she does. Here's the 
here. She is laying blame on the prophet when she lays the child on the prophet's door in, in the prophet's room and she closes the door and she leaves. So I mentioned to you that our first appearance of Eliyahu, of Elisha, excuse me, is that Elisha goes up to this Aliyah, he goes up to this Aliyah Kir, he goes up to this chamber and he lies down. So here we have the lying down, but the lying down is the lying down of death, right? It's the ultimate, uh, it's the ultimate sleep, the last sleep. And then she she does something quite unexpected. Now all of a sudden, only when she loses the child does she say, I need to go to this prophet. I need to go to this Ish Elohim. I am running. Uh, you know, uh, 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 saddle up the donkey so that I can go um, as quickly as possible. Now the husband is, he doesn't even ask about the child. It's, it, he's, they're so disengaged from each other that he doesn't even know that the child has died. She, it's as if she puts him up there in the room. I hope you're seeing all the curiosity and oddity of the story. She puts him up. She doesn't even say anything to her husband as if, don't even get in my way. Um, he says, uh, you know, usually you only go on on, on holidays. Now, um, I, I want to mention, uh, this is uh, Oriel Simone's book, Reading Prophetic Narratives, where he discusses this story. And he makes a uh, master, master teacher and, um, and, and it's a brilliant book. And um, he makes the point that the husband perhaps you know, is not sure about this relationship. You know, she makes a room for a strange man. Suddenly she gets pregnant with a strange man. Th these overtones of suspicion um, appear also in the Shimshon story, in uh, Shimshon's birth. Uh, what is this man doing here? And why are you going now? I mean, you usually only go on Shabbat or holidays. Uh, help me understand. And she doesn't, she doesn't bother even answering. <laughs> And she says, go quickly. Don't disturb me. Don't disturb me. Don't stop me. Don't distract me un unless I tell you to. Now, I, I'm not sure. And uh, excuse me. I'm not sure how what the distance is between Shunam and Har Carmel. If anyone knows that distance, please feel free to drop it in the chat. But she, I, I imagine that this is not a short trip. So she goes to the Ish Elohim El Har Carmel by he kirot Ish Elohim Oto Mineged when she sees him Mineged, right? In other words, she sees him and there's almost a combative sense here in the text that she sees him opposite her. El Gechazi Naro Hinea Shunamit Halaz. And um, he says, right, imagine he's, you know, he's on a high mountain. He sees her coming up the mountain and he says, oh, there's that Shunamite woman again. What is she bothering us with? We gave her a child. Wasn't that enough? And he says, He says, you know, like, ask her how everything's doing. Now, of course, he's a prophet. Shouldn't he know how she's doing? Shouldn't he know what's going on? And notice she is not interested in Gehazi, not one bit. She says, thanks very much. Now she is not, she's no longer dispassionate and removed. She comes up to the, the prophet. Remember before she, she, she sort of urged the prophet to stay at her home. Now she grabs him. And Gehazi comes to push her away. So now, finally, Alicia understands something. Alicia understands that something tragic has happened and that this woman is bitter. He now understands that all, all of his remoteness, as sometimes leaders can be so distant, all of that remoteness has come at an extremely high cost and that God, God has held, withheld this information from him. He will have to hear it from her. And did I ask you, did I ask you for a child? Hello, did I not say to you, don't, don't disillusion me, don't mislead me. Didn't I say to you, I didn't ask for this. Didn't I say I'm happy amongst my people? 
ואומר לגי חזי חגור מתנך וקח משענתי בידיך ולך כי תמצא איש לא תברכנו וכי יברך לך איש לא תעננו. So now Elisha sends Gehazi and he says, you know, prepare yourself, take your step in hand, and if anyone greets you, you know, because obviously you're the um, you're the assistant to um, to this important prophet, don't don't answer. And again, he makes the mistake. He he this time he treats it with urgency, but he doesn't treat it personally. He says, go go put your staff on this child and see if he if he comes back to life. But Tomer Aim Hanar, now the mother of the child says, Chai Hashem, V'chai Nafshecha, Im Ezveka, V'yakam V'yilich Acharaha. He says, she says to him, I need to teach you something about what it means to bring a child into this world. As long as you live, as long as God lives, I, I am not leaving you. You need to come with me, right? And he followed her. Now, this is amazing. The prophet who had the upper hand in the beginning of the story now has the lower hand. Now it's the, the unnamed woman who says, I need to teach you something about, about responsibility, about responsibility for that which you have created. So of course you knew that this wasn't going to work. Gehazi tries his magic stick. He puts it on the face of the child. But there's no, there's no, uh, there's no voice. There's no heartbeat. There's nothing. Reshev lekratovi aged lo vayomer lo hekitz hanar, and he says to him, "I couldn't revive this child." And of course he couldn't revive him. Of course he couldn't. Now anar is not a yelled anymore, right? He's he's an older child. Um, we're not sure exactly how old he is, but we're but that but that language indicates he could be he could be over he could be prepubescent. He could be an adolescent. Revo Elisha habaita. And Elisha goes into the house. This has been the subject of some paintings. Um, it's done in, it's painted in a very beautiful and very tragic way. Imagine for a moment, this is the special room that this woman has made for you. And you were only a month ago, perhaps, you were lying on that bed and enjoying yourself. And then you, and then without God's permission, you thought that you could bring life into this world. And it would just, you know, you had that kind of power. And now you see in sort of a Mary Shelley Frankenstein way, there's a child lying on that bed and that, and that young man is dead. Just as she closed the door on her child, he now closed the door on, uh, and, and left both of them inside. This is what he should have done all those years ago, all those days ago, all those months ago. He should have prayed to God and said, God, what can I give this woman? He should have spoken to her. He should have understood her needs. He should have related to her. But instead, now he has to pay the price and he prays to God that God will do something about this error that he's made. And then, without God sending any word as to what he should do, he lies across the child totally. He puts himself on that child, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. These are the mechanisms which we communicate with others. The eyes, the mouth, the hands. He communicates totally with this child. He understands now all the intimacy that's been missing in this relationship. Yicham basar hayaled. And the, and, the, and the skin of this child begins to warm. Yishev hayaled babayit achad. In the ancient world, sneezing was, as we say, bless you, sneezing was a sign of vitality. So all of a sudden, he sneezes, and the sneeze is the indication, sort of like when you hit a child, uh, so that the child cries after a child is born, so you have an indication that the child is well. And Elisha calls Gehazi, and once again, he makes the mistake of not knowing her name. All of this has happened, and he doesn't know her by name. And he says, "See, Vanech, pick up your child. This is the message that the Malach Hashem gives to Hagar in chapter 21 of Breshit of Kaf Aleph, where Hagar leaves her child 
even though she has a divine promise, God promised that this child, God promised that this child would be hers, um, that would, would, be, would be the progenitor of a nation. And she puts him when she runs out of water at the side and she does nothing to provide relief. And he says those same words, pick up your child. She fell at his feet. She bowed down to the ground and she picked up her child. This is the first act of intimacy between mother and child. She picked him up when he was, when he was dead. Now she can pick him up when he's alive. And now she can become the mother she needs to be. Why did I choose this story? As we'll see momentarily, Rabbi Sachs was very concerned about the absorption of self and sometimes our refusal to ask for help and, and the importance of how help enables, the, the request for help enables others to become part of our lives and creates intimacy. It's not only that we need to ask for help, it's that people, there's a nobility in people also taking us up on that offer. That is what builds relationships. In this story, almost no one is connected to each other. Almost no one asks for help. The Shunamid says, I'm good the way that I am. She doesn't ask for help from her husband. Um, he does not offer her any help. He does not offer the child any help. Uh, Gehazi does not ask Alicia uh, it, you know, commits his, Alicia to be involved with this uh, child and to create this child that he takes no responsibility for. So in, in a way, both of these characters teach something to the other. Gehazi and Alicia teach the Shunammite women, Shunammite woman, you should want a child. You should believe that we could give it to you and you should take care of him. How did you let this happen? See Vanech, pick up your child. Every nation, every relationship, all of Masorah begins with picking up a child. And then the other side is true as well. She, the Isha Shunamit, the unnamed woman, teaches him something extremely important. She teaches Elisha. And by virtue of teaching Elisha, she also teaches Gehazi. Betoch ami ani yoshavet. I dwell among my people, as should you. You're spending so much time with kings and officers and others that perhaps you didn't bother getting to know me. I, who was went to all this trouble to do something of kindness for you, you didn't bother to know me. You didn't ask me what I wanted. You didn't listen to me when I told you this wasn't what I wanted. And perhaps the lesson here that she teaches the Navi is be involved, be responsible for that which you create. So with that, um, actually, I'm going to stop the share for a moment. Um, I've talked much more than I wanted to. Um, any thoughts on this story, observations that you want to share as we've read the story together? Oh, and thank you, Debbie, at 53 kilometers. That's, that's a distance. That's a distance. Thoughts about this story? Different readings? I love a good debate. All right, we're gonna go back to our screen share. Um, I'm, I'm not giving up on you. You're welcome to talk anytime you like. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how this story can illustrate um, something uh, that, uh, uh, an insight that Rabbi Sachs gave that I, that I, uh, that I think is very important. Um, and I'm gonna share with you some of the quotes from uh, his book, Morality. Um, where he does a more full explication of his love for self-help books with a little bit of cynicism. He says, help for me has always been other help. Nonetheless, I am, I admit, a longtime devotee of self-help books. I have felt the fear and done it anyway. I have refrained from sweating the small stuff. I've experienced the life-changing magic of tidying. I know the power of now. I'm okay and you're okay. And I no longer sit worrying who moved my cheese. I've read more books on happiness than I can count shelf loads of them. And my commitment stretches way back to the classics of the gene. I've even read the very first Samuel Smiles self-help written in 1859 with its no-nonsense opening, heaven helps those who help themselves. So I don't mean any criticism of such books, still less of those who read them. But one thing has always puzzled me from the outset, the obvious thing, self surely is where it begins, not where it ends. 
It's the problem, not the solution. Um, if I look back on my life, I discovered that it was always someone else who set me on a new trajectory. I suspect the same is true for most people. What he's saying is, on the one hand, we read self-help books and we might get insight into how we can manage a situation differently. Perhaps we're feeling particularly anxious about something and we read Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and we're able to label something. This is small and whereas this is a priority. Maybe we're, we read something so that it can help us in managing others. Certainly, I read a lot of um, leadership books, which I would say are sort of a leadership self-help book. How do, you, how do you supervise? How do you manage? How do you motivate people? How do you inspire people? How do you fundraise? All of these things provide important, what we, we might call life hacks, important ways in which we can get by and handle a situation differently. But the problem is, when I'm sitting in my room and I'm reading a self-help book, what I'm not doing is actually reaching out to others and seeing what guidance they might give me in my management of a situation. Because what a self-help book can never do and what a leadership book can never do is understand the unique context in which we find our own commitments and our own difficulties. Um, and um, uh, uh, Jody, I just uh, this, um, this um, I wanted to just comment on your comment in the chat. There's a whole section of the book store called Self Help. What we need is a section called Help Others. All right, Simon Sinek, thank you uh, very much. Um, so uh, let's look at um, uh, as as he continues the uh, the idea being that um, that that what has really changed us in life. Uh, is, is often a comment that someone else has made, the comment of a parent or a teacher or a friend or a mentor or a boss or a fellow colleague. It's worth thinking about why self-help in this peculiarly modern sense has emerged, often as a substitute for what in previous centuries would have been a religious quest. The answer, I think, was given by the American scholar Philip Reif in his book, The Triumph of the Therapeutic, published in 1966. One of his most insightful points was that in all previous generations, people helped those suffering depression or loss or bereavement by seeking to reintegrate them into the community. That, for example, is the point of the ancient and still powerful Jewish custom of Shiva. A bereaved family sit together for a week and are visited by members of the community and by friends. It's a period in which you are hardly ever alone. It is exhausting, but it achieves many things. Above all, it prevents you from retreating into yourself. It softens the jagged edges of grief. So um, imagine for a moment that instead of sitting Shiva, you had a book, a book that was on managing grief, um, and you were reading that book. Now, you might read that book, and it may give you some guidance and help, interesting things to think about. Um, I've actually even written such a book, but I understand, I know firsthand that it's nothing like being at someone else's Shiva or having other people join you in your Shiva and being able to, to tell those stories again and again and having people to bring you the gift of stories. Those, it is in those interactions that we, that we change, that we are profoundly influenced by others. Let's keep going. Another comment that he makes, again, in morality, a leader cannot be in the fray and above it at the same time, nor can any single figure embody all the requisite colleagues, qualities. A young leader may experience, an experienced leader may lack youth and fail to see opportunities. There must be at least one other voice, spouse, friend, advisor, trusted colleague, because the judgment of even the greatest will fail at times. These figures are often invisible to the public. They're helpful precisely because they're discreet. Yet they're often a leader's most important defense, and that's, uh, and that's the English spelling, uh, not the American, against disaster. And without them, failure will eventually follow. A leader's strengths are his or her own, but it takes someone else to protect them from their weaknesses. Self-help is often not help at all. Um, we can't take out a self-help book and read it to someone. Um, we learn often through experience. Uh, imagine, <laughs> imagine you took a book on parenting and you you read the sleep section to your infant. Here's here's how I'm going to get you to sleep. Things don't always work in the way that they appear in black and white on a page. And so for Rabbi Sachs, always the presence of another is the way that we change ourselves. And I think in this story, when Elisha locks himself up in a room and he does not hear others' needs, he can't respond appropriately. When the Isha Shunamit says, I'm happy the way that I am, she's also not thinking of the power of request that maybe someone else can change her life for the better. 
Um, and I want to cite something that Rabbi Sachs cited often in this context and in others. This is a Gemara. Oh, I'm sorry. I um, I took off. This is Gemara and Brachot uh, 5b, which is uh, there before. Amri, ein chavush matir atzmo mi beta asurim. A prisoner cannot release himself from prison, right? He needs other people to do so. We might think that we have the key when we don't even know that we're in jail. Um, and it makes this point in To Heal a Fractured World. There are depressive states in which we simply cannot do it on our own. A prisoner cannot release himself from prison. Um, he'll use this expression again in uh, in Parshat Vayera in one of Covenant and Conversation. And I've included these sources in the handout is in the chat. And I want to thank Johnny Solomon, uh, who's uh, who's an incredible resource for all things Rabbi Sachs in terms of quotes. He helped me find um, several of these. Consider addiction. The first few times you smoke a cigarette or drink alcohol or take drugs, you do so freely. You know the risks, but you ignore them. As time goes by, you're almost powerless to resist it. At that point, you may have to go into rehabilitation. You no longer on your own have the ability to stop. As the Talmud says, a prisoner cannot release himself from prison. Self-help is when you really need help. It's when you're drowning and you lift your hand up and you wave and somebody takes hold of your hand and lifts you to safety. Or to use the other metaphor used by the Talmud, a prisoner cannot release himself from prison. You can't cure your own depression. Someone else needs to release you from that prison. So as you can see, this is a theme that appears in several places. But I actually um, want to share that Rabbi Sachs uses his own life experience to explicate this. He does so in morality, and he does so elsewhere. And I want to um, read this text to you. It's from a conversation that he had with Ada Schottenstein and Riff Prinsky, and, um, and where he uses this principle in a very compelling, very personal way. This is a story, again, he tells, um, he tells it fleshes out in his book, Morality. I was very struck by the statement in the Gemara, en chavush matir atatzmo mi beit asurim that a prisoner cannot release himself from prison. You know, somebody else has to turn the key. And that seemed to me very much the case on something like depression, for example. Depression, unless you're just treating it chemically, unless you're just taking antidepressants, you cannot get out of that state. You need somebody else to help you do so. And this was always very clear to me. But the example I gave, of course, I'm not going to tell the story in detail, came from our honeymoon when I nearly drowned. I mean, it's too, and you can imagine here are these three dots, the pause, for the difficulty of sharing this story with others. I still find it a bit scary to tell the story terribly often. You know, I went under for the fifth time and there was no one near, and this was in Italy. And I said, I remember my last two thoughts. Number one, what a way to begin our honeymoon. And number two, what's the Italian for help? But clearly somebody else saw me and saved me and so on. But self-help was absolutely no use at the time, none whatsoever. I was drowning. And I needed somebody to hold my hand and pull me out. And I think a lot of our personal problems do tend to be like that. Now, obviously, self-help is real and important. And it's what Hillel meant when he said, Im ain anili mili, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? So clearly, we have to work on things ourselves. Nobody else can save our problems for us. But it does really need somebody else to, as it were, metaphorically hold our hand when we manage to get on dry land. And I don't think these things are stressed often enough in the self-help literature. It's wonderful literature no criticism of it, but it does leave out the fact that we need somebody else to take us out of that locked room. And I want to stop here because I think this is one of Rabbi Sachs's um, most profound gifts is that he was able to use the text of his own life to illustrate. It was not easy to tell that story, um, a story that, as I mentioned, he tells in greater depth in his book, Morality, um, to be able to, and I, I think he told these stories, if I'm not mistaken, later in life, when perhaps he felt more comfortable sharing with others and using himself periods where he himself um, experienced low states. He talks um, in several books about the low state he experienced after the death of his father for two years. He really struggled to get out of that. Now you can read a lot of self-help books, but that's not what's going to lift you up and carry you over the dark cloud. Um, and, and, um, and, and, um, and again, I think he doesn't derail these books. I think he thinks that they're really important, but he thinks ultimately the help that we need, and we're often so afraid to ask, is the help from others. It's to be able to say to someone else in extreme cases of, uh, of addiction or a, a variety uh, or levels of depression, and then in other cases when we simply ask someone else for help. Just this morning, I was in conversation with someone and I said, um, please ask for help. 
And he sent me a, a message and he said, I'm not good at asking for help. Um, so, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, if you, when, when you ask, you enable other people to be there for you. You enable other people to actually do what they want to do. I want to share an incredible thing. Um, I almost canceled today because in a few hours I'm getting on a plane to take along with Terry Herrenstein, who uh, my, my blessed friend and partner who is uh, coming with us, we are taking 28 Yeshiva, Yeshiva University students to work with Hungarian, uh, Ukrainian refugees in Vienna. Um, they've been, the Viennese Jewish community has been taking Jewish and non-Jewish refugees by the hundreds. And uh, we're leaving in a few hours. This trip was, was created in only a few days. And I, I have to share with you, and I'm gonna try not to get verklempt when I say this, I left a message late, late yesterday afternoon in my own synagogue, how many people came with donations. It was really like the story of Moshe and the Mishkan. I had to tell people to stop, right? People, I mean, cash, cash always works. Uh, that always fits in the suitcase. But la things, a, a, a list of what people needed, not just giving anything that we wanted, but really in the Elisha and Shunammite, the, the story, of the, 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 the phrasing of the story is to give people what they actually ask for. The Viennese community let us know this is what we need. And all we had to do was ask. And you know what? It wasn't a burden to ask. It helped people feel less helpless in the face of a tragedy that's going on for many of us on the other side of the world. People want to help. I just wanna give a tiny example. A friend of mine was on a plane and she was lecturing in front of a, she was, she was bound to lecture on the other side of the country uh, to a very prestigious group. And she realized that she, she didn't have her suit. So she actually told the, the, told the airline, uh, she told the steward, the steward helped her make a call to a store. They put a message out on the, um, on the, on the airplane um, communication that someone was looking for a ride to a particular mall so she could buy the same suit. And within a minute, and everyone was very happy to help. And I use that as, as a, a tiny and an insignificant example, because I think it speaks volumes to the way people are willing to help in small and also even more so in large causes. I wanna go back to our shared screen because our story of, the Alicia, uh, of Alicia and the Shunammite woman does not, does not end here. Um, it, ends with, um, it ends with a, um, with a little postscript, and I'll read that postscript to you. This occurs four chapters later uh, in, in Melachim Bet. So a king is talking to Elisha, and he says, I, 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 to Gehazi, and he says, like, I want to know all the amazing things that your boss is doing. By he who misaper lomelech, so he's telling him this amazing story, this amazing story of, uh, of Gehazi and Elisha and the revival of this child. And just at that moment, this woman walks in and he says, oh my goodness, this is actually the exact child. This is, this is the woman whose child um, Elisha revived. Now it happens in the intervening chapters that there was a terrible fout, uh, uh, there was a terrible dram, drought and famine and uh, land was re requisitioned and Alicia uh, and, and this woman comes to complain that she, her property has been taken and, um, and the king restores the property. Now, um, uh, um, Uriel Simone says, we may conclude that the, the, this, little, um, this little story is utterly different from the story of the woman of Shunem in its narrative mode, but totally dependent on it for its contents. It's not read as part of the story, but it's an interscriptural response to it. Um, so in other words, this story is a response to what she said earlier. He said to her, do you want me to speak to anyone in high place? Is there something you need? And she said, no. But in actuality, there's something that she did need later on, where speaking to the king actually was beneficial to her. So it's not true. Sometimes we think, I'm happy, I'm good the way I am, I don't need any help. But in fact, the offer that they made before ended up, in fact, being useful in the end. 
I want to sh uh, share a comment from a book that Rabbi Sachs quotes um, sporadically, and that's the book by Will Storer called Selfie, How We Become So Self-Obsessed and What It's Doing to Us, How We Became So Self-Obsessed. One of the dictums that defines our culture is that we can be anything you we want to be. To win the neoliberal game, we have to dream, to put our minds to it, to want it badly enough. This message leaks out to us from seemingly everywhere in our environment, at the cinema and in heartwarming, inspiring stories we read in the news and social media, in advertising, in self-help help books in the classroom, on television, we internalize it, incorporating it into our sense of self, but it's not true. It is in fact the dark lie at the heart of the age of perfectionism. It's the cause, I believe, of an incalculable quotient of misery. Here's the truth that no million selling self-help book, famous motivational speaker, happiness guru, or blockbusting Hollywood screenwriter seems to want you to know. You're limited, imperfect, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, this is a sad message, and I don't share this author's particular pessimism, but I will share this. Sometimes we think that we buy a book and it's going to teach us, and we're going to figure life out through books. Goodness knows that's pretty much my library, figuring things out. I remember buying a book when I was doing my PhD and I had to learn German. So buying this book, um, you know, German the easy way. Well, for any of you who speak German, you know, there is no easy way. And, and the title was so appealing that I thought I could just buying the book and through osmosis, having it on my shelves would actually solve the problem. I understand the temptation to say the book is the solution, but we know that often when it comes to the things that plague us the most, the difficulties that we, that, we, that, that, that repeat themselves year in and year out, that we need a process that it takes a long time. And that most importantly, we need to make ourselves vulnerable and tell others. And when we're able to articulate that need, that's when we get responses. Rav Salvechik very, very beautifully said in a number of places that all gula, the, the act of redemption begins with the word. You cannot redeem someone unless they tell you they need help. And that means not only being responsive when someone else needs the help, as I've seen illustrated so many, so many times in my life. And just today, in fact, I, I had to put a note on the door while I was teaching because people keep bringing things. Please don't ring the bell. Um, when we ask for help, we get it. But the problem is that some of us can't ask for help. We can ask help for others, but we're not so good in asking help for ourselves. And I think that was one of Rabbi Sachs's last and great gifts to the Jewish community and to every single person in the world. He tried to, he tried to impact with his ideas. Um, community, community means that an individual always has a place to go, understands that he or she is never alone. And that in the act of helping, in the act of asking for help, we actually create and begin relationships of deep intimacy. Um, I just want to stop and thank you all for joining me on this Sunday morning. I wish you a Shabbat Tov and um, take any questions or observations you have. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy um, that my lovely friends, Sim and Henry Weinberg are on this. Uh, many happy years we spent together in London and beyond. And she says it was through sharing that, that Rabbi Sachs had the greatest impact on others. And because he did this, people felt close to him and were able to cope with their insecurities. Other thoughts, other questions. I love that observation, Reba, you cannot perform CPR on yourself. Uh, the lockdown during the pandemic, Deborah has validated, uh, even though Zoom has been wonderful, it's true. But I, I can say having now taught classes in person, there is nothing more wonderful than the three-dimensional people that I'm in contact with. Um, Susie, we're wired to think negatively and sometimes have a hard time rising above these tendencies. What such books do is pump you up and give you the confidence in thinking differently and building a positive mindset. And by the way, if there is a self-help book that has been particularly helpful to you, please drop it in the chat. Let's share. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll share one from a leadership space, leadership and self-deception. I think that's been one of the most incredible books in my leadership journey. Uh, I'll just put it in the, it's put out by the Arbinger Institute. So I'm going to just put it out to everybody. Uh, anyone else have a question? Observation. All right, if not, I will wish you all a blessed week and I'm taking all of your 
thoughts and your tefillot, your prayers with me um, to help the refugees. I feel that we're not going alone. We're going with the, the koach, the force of all the Jewish people. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, next week, we are very, very privileged to have with us Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Schachter, who will be speaking, please God, about the reflections on the life of Rabbi Sachs. We're looking forward to seeing you all next week. Same time, same place. Take care and Shavuot everybody.